Hello, welcome to Psych 105, Introduction to Psychology. Today we're going to be discussing motivation and emotion. So let's start off with motivation, which refers to the various physiological and psychological factors that cause us to act in a specific way at a particular time. In other words, why do we behave in a certain way at a certain time? Three characteristics that demonstrate motivation include they energize you to engage in an activity, what motivates you to get off the couch and clean the kitchen, for example, what directs your energies to achieve a specific goal, why do some people finish college and other people don't, and you have an intensity of feeling about reaching that goal. And again, it's that drive that is inside of you that pushes you to get to that finish line. So there's some theories of motivation. Um, there's the fixed action pattern, which is an, an innate biological force that predisposes an organism to behave in a fixed way in the presence of a specific environmental condition. And we're going to talk about that specifically in terms of um, sexuality um, because when you see an attractive person that you're very, um, you find very alluring, you have this overwhelming motivation to get to know them. Uh, second, we have our brain which has the reward and pleasure centers which include several areas of the brain and involve several neurotransmitters, especially dopamine. Dopamine is our um, neurotransmitter that's involved in a lot of the pleasure that we receive as you remember back uh, when we talked about uh, substance abuse. Genes have been linked to several behaviors that trigger the brain's reward pleasure center including obesity, risk-taking behaviors such as gambling, nicotine addiction, and sexual activity. So uh, when we look at these ideas of motivation we have to remember that it's not just this idea of well I feel like I should do this, it's much more essential, biological than that. We have incentives, we have goals that can either be objects or thoughts that we learn to value that we are motivated to obtain. So for example, you know, why do people put themselves through the agony of going to college? Um, oftentimes it is because they want to pursue a career in a specialized area and you have to have a very particular education. Um, alternatively, you know, um, every research study shows that people who have finished college make more money than people who haven't. So, um, you know, whatever the motivations are, they can be enough to help us achieve a specific goal. Incentives have two common features. They can be thoughts or they can be objects. So we can either feel something in terms of I feel really good when I have achieved this goal or I got a huge raise by doing a really good job. So that is that object. And then there's that cognitive factors of the extrinsic and intrinsic motivation and we'll talk about those in more detail. Extrinsic motivation involves engaging in certain activities or behaviors that either reduce the biological needs or help us obtain incentives or external rewards. So let's say that you are in sales and your boss gives you a sales contract that says if you hit your budget this year you will win a trip to the Bahamas. And you know that if you work 52 hours a week instead of 40 you will hit your budget no problem and you'll win that free trip. So that extrinsic motivator is right there and you kind of use that as a carrot and you know to, to look at and, and, and go towards. Intrinsic motivation involves engaging in certain activities or behaviors because the behaviors themselves are personally rewarding or because engaging in these activities fulfills our beliefs or expectations. 
So for example, a lot of times when I speak with people who uh, want to be nurses or physical therapy assistants, I ask them why. And a lot of times it's because they feel good about helping others. It gives them a sense of doing something for others which helps them feel better about you know going to work every day you know they're not just putting another cog in the wheel they're actually making a difference in other people's lives so that's an intrinsic motivation human needs in terms of motivation basically break down into three primary categories. Biological needs are physiological requirements that are critical to our survival and well-being. Food, sleep, water, oxygen, protection needs, safety, housing, legal protections. You know, if you don't have security, you really don't feel safe. And then social needs, and these are needs that are acquired through learning and experience. Um, social needs such as having friendships, having a partner in life, um, any of those needs that we have developed over time that we begin to crave as we get older. And this leads us to probably the most famous of all uh, researchers in terms of motivation and this is Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And satisfying one's needs is at the core of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And um, his brand of psychology is called positive psychology. So we're going to start at the bottom with our physiological needs. And again, food, water, um, sleep. These are the b needs that our bodies need to survive. Level two, safety needs such as housing, um, security, feeling like you have somewhere you can run you know let your guard down level three are the love and belonging needs our social needs having a partner having friends having a family level four esteem needs that success that feeling that you have made a difference in the world and then finally level five which is what we hope to achieve all of us which is self-actualization which is achieving the highest level of what we're possible, what we have potential of, you know, that kind of Oprah Winfrey moment where we achieve the most we can possibly achieve in our lives. So when we look at this triangle or pyramid, we see that the most, most basic needs form the base. And that's really important because without those physiological needs being met, we cannot even begin to look at any of the other needs. And especially if you're going into healthcare, this is an important aspect because you can't talk to somebody about their love and belonging needs or their success or esteem needs if they have nowhere to live or if they don't have a steady food source. And again, especially in social work or behavioral health, these become so prevalent because you have to help them find those basic needs first. You have to get them stabilized before you can move on to any other of those very important needs. So let's talk about some of our social needs. Two of the most significant biological needs people have are food and sex. And uh, food, of course, is one of our basic physiological needs. And of course, sex, you can live without sex, but it's a social need that um, oftentimes gets us into uh, situations. So these two areas can create significant problems in terms of how society uses both to motivate and control humans. I mean, you're sitting on the couch watching TV and a commercial comes on that shows dessert shows pizza, shows ice cream, and all of a sudden you're starving. Or you're watching TV and there's an ad for some kind of sexual aid, or there's a very pretty girl or a very handsome guy, and all of a sudden you're not interested in the TV show. So, you know, these all coalesce in our minds to motivate us, and not always for the better. So let's start off with talking about obesity and 
eating and how food has become such an issue in this country. 67% of Americans are overweight based on their BMI, their body mass index. Now you'll see on the right hand side on the bottom there is a map of the United States. All of the orange states have a BMI between 20 and 24 percent. That is over overwhelming you know and that's just overwhelmingly bizarre. Then you have the um, red states which goes over 25 percent and then the yellow states now notice you don't see a lot of green or blue states where the BMI is average or below average 40 percent of five to eight year olds would like to be thinner these are little girls these are little girls these are girls who are barely able to tie their own shoes 80 percent of 10 year old girls are afraid of being fat and yet by the time they're adults, 70% of them will probably be overweight. 33% of teenage boys are unhe use unhealthy methods to control their weight, including smoking, vomiting, and using laxatives. Um, you know, it used to be back in the day that girls were always a little concerned about their weight, but boys were, you know, they would eat a pizza for lunch and then another pizza for dinner. Nowadays guys are just as worried about their appearance because social requirements demand that boys have the six pack or the eight pack and have a cute butt and all the other things that are expected. So that's why you see that t-shirt that says Generation X which are the kids who were born between 1964 and 1984 and Generation XXXL which of course are the children of the Millennials who uh, you know unfortunately do tend to have a lot of weight issues. So there are three primary eating disorders that we're going to look at. We're not going to really look at the more um, rare ones like pica which is when a person has an overwhelming desire to eat sand or drywall which if you've ever watched My Strange Addiction I'm sure you know what that is. Um, obesity is a condition defined as excess adipose tissue usually caused by excessive eating. Anorexia nervosa is an eating disorder characterized by not maintaining an appropriate body weight for height, age, and stature, and in many individuals distorted body image. People with anorexia generally restrict the number of calories and the types of food they eat. Some people with the disorder also exercise compulsively, purge via vomiting and laxatives, and or binge eat. Finally, bulimia nervosa, eating disorder characterized by a cycle of binging and behaviors such as self-induced vomiting designed to undo the effects of binge eating. And one of the bigger issues with bulimia is that you really mess up um, your your gastrointestinal system because you're eating food and then you're just vomiting it back up so your esophagus your mouth your teeth all get very damaged in this process so how do eating div disorders develop well some research points to parental influence when parents project their own unhappiness with their own bodies onto their adolescents telling them they're getting fat and need to lose work lose weight History of child abuse, especially sex abuse. Sociocultural factors such as how the media promotes certain body types as being favored above all others. A 2005 University Pittsburgh study suggests in the journal Biological Psychiat Psychiatry that overactivity of dopamine receptors in the brain's basal ganglia can impact the development of anorexia. And in 2017, a multi-institute study led by the University of North Carolina School of Medicine, researchers identified a genetic marker on chromosome 12 that is associated with the development of anorexia. So as you can see, you know, the research is coming in fast and furious, and it looks as if a lot of these eating disorders are related to the brain and to how our neurotransmitters work and a lot of how our limbic system might work. The
key for this is that in the same way that you know a, a disease like anorexia affects us so does obesity and there are similar studies that reflect obesity being uh, largely in part to the pleasure reward center in our brain being miswired so moving on to sex why do humans have sex well there's genetics there's genes that determine sex hormone levels and neural pathways that determine sexual reflexes somewhere around 13 or 14 young boys and young women suddenly decide that the opposite gender usually and in about five percent of the cases same gender starts to look awfully good to them which leads to biology. The sex hormones that determine when we enter puberty determine sexual motivation. So you have some people who have less sex hormones, which means they're going to have a smaller sex drive. So you have some people who, you know, they seem to be ready to roll 24 hours a day and other people, you know, twice a year, birthday and Christmas, and they're good to go. Psychological determines gender roles, affects performance or enjoyment, plays a role in sexual orientation and sexual identity. So, you know, there is a psychological need for sex in terms of wanting to be close to someone, wanting that companionship, that connectivity, that need for a person to share time with. And remember, when we have an orgasm, oxytocin comes out, which is that cuddle hormone, which makes us feel very comfortable and content, and we like that feeling. So here are some statistics about sex, and you know, these are always surprising to people because their perspective is a little bit skewed because we live in a very urban area. and. Um, we tend to see things much differently than if you lived in Kansas or Indiana. The average age that people in the US lose their virginity is 17 and that's from a California State University um, research study. According to a survey of adults aged 20 to 59, women have an average of four sexual partners during their lifetime. Men have an average of seven so when your buddy is bragging that he's in the triple digits he's kind of a hoe and uh, you know because the average guy is not really that sexually active and that's from the National Center for Health Statistics the rate of homosexuality and bisexuality in America is approximately 5% but almost 16% of women report experimenting with same-sex interactions and that's from the Centers for Disease Control so you know the statistics about sex really are based on academic research whereas you know if you're looking at uh, information that's been put out by you know you see something on Facebook or Twitter that is related to a um, you know people doing a survey online that is not scientifically uh, set up correctly yeah you could have much more skewed results but you have to look at it from that stratified sample you have to make sure that it has all of the um, sampling issues that we talked about in the first few weeks of class so something else to think about which is that men's primary sexual hormone is testosterone which triggers the pituitary gland to secrete hormones on a daily basis resulting in the continuous production of sperm women do not have significant levels of testosterone so the absence triggers the pituitary gland to secrete hormones on a cyclical basis or monthly women's sex hormones is estrogen so you have to keep in mind and we have to kind of almost think about this in terms of you know men have a reputation of having a very high sex drive and women have a reputation of not well the reality is women have a very high sex drive for several days a month but their bodies are set up to be pregnant and as a consequence to that 
they're going to have several days where they are ready to roll and other days where they are protecting their bodies, i.e. they're not interested in sex because they potentially could be pregnant. Now in today's modern world where we have all kinds of uh, ways of preventing pregnancy, that is almost obsolete. However, our bodies haven't caught up to society yet. Remember, evolution takes place over a very long time. Gender roles are traditional behaviors, attitudes, and personality traits of each gender. They influence how we think and behave. For example, American gender roles, and I'm not talking about Western European or Asian gender roles, just American. Male gender roles, you have to be dominating, controlling, and independent. And female gender roles tend to be sensitive, nurturing, and concerned. Very different perspectives on what a man is and what a woman is. And, you know, as each generation develops, you see differences and changes and evolutions. So that's a great thing. What you do see, however, is a consistently men ranking attractiveness as being primary for them in a mate. Women ranking financial resources as being primary for them in a mate. And there's a reason for that. We'll get back to that in a minute. But androgyny is another issue that we see a lot of these days. Androgyny is the combination of masculine and feminine characteristics and also includes gender ambiguity. The BEM sex role inventory measures androgyny. It's based on gender stereotypes, so what it's actually measuring is how well you fit into your traditional sex role. And it's not necessarily about whether or not you wear makeup or not. It's about the stereotypical way men are described and the way women are described. And if you are neutral or not gender typed. So for example, the picture on the top is Ruby Rose, who's a... Um, model and actress. She was in Orange is the New Black and she wears her hair short and she wears suits and she's very masculine looking but she's gorgeous. She's a beautiful woman and then below her is a guy who um, you know obviously with the facial hair and the short hair very masculine but he is great at makeup and he does all these makeup tutorials on YouTube. So let's get back to our gender roles evolutionary theory and this is a big one men have a greater interest in sex and multiple partners because it maximizes their chances for reproduction women have a lesser interest in sex and multiple partners because they valued a stable environment to raise their children women have always placed a higher value on finding a good provider and protector so getting back to that idea of men wanting a more attractive partner and women looking for a partner who has financial resources we get to this evolutionary theory going back a hundred thousand years where you know a man especially if he was the alpha male of the tribe he was responsible for making sure the women were pregnant because the biological imperative of that time period was to ensure the continuation of the species and the continuation of the species relied on women being pregnant and considering the fact that um, infant mortality was so high in those days you had to have women pregnant just about every year so consequently what you began to see was you know women would be pregnant and once they became pregnant they were basically put in a situation where their pregnancy was the most important thing and they needed someone to protect them they needed someone to provide for them because you know that's the one thing a man cannot do which is bring the next generation into the world so a man's place became protecting and providing a woman's place became bringing the next generation into the world and raising them into adulthood then we have social learning theory. 
which declares that there are two ways children learn their gender roles. One, they receive rewards or punishment for specific gender role behaviors. And two, they watch and imitate the behavior of others. The belief that children imitate the same sex parents, so little girls hang out with mom and little boys hang out with dad. Socialization of children is one of the major causes of gender differences between boys and girls because, again, what you tend to see is little girls on the playground hanging out with each other and little boys hanging out with each other on the playground. Children are encouraged to do the appropriate gender type activities by their families, peers, teachers, and the media. So, you know, over there on the right, I have a little cartoon that says sex is what you're born with gender is what you're given so you're born with either a penis or a vagina but as you grow up you're taught to like certain things so the boy is given an action figure and the little girl is given a doll and of course you know action man and passivity girl but but the point is and and this is a little interesting aside is that when they realized that little boys were just as interested in playing with dolls, i.e. Barbies, um, as girls were, they decided that they would start making G.I. Joes, but they didn't want to call it a doll. So instead, they created the concept of the action figure. We don't even use the word doll in terms of that concept. So again, what you see here is society reinforcing certain stereotypes so that as boys and girls grow up they're integrated into this world without even realizing it. So moving on to biosocial theory which emphasizes social and cultural forces to explain the differences in sexual activities and mate selection. Parents and other people label and begin to react to the child based on his or her genitals. The way they are treated socially in combination with their biological sex will determine the child's gender. Additionally, there was a researcher, Dr. John Money, who believed that babies are born gender neutral and that social forces shape their gender. So yes, they're born with a penis or a vagina, however, that their gender is f shaped by society. And he was given an opportunity to test this theory. And it came about through a person who became intersex. Now intersex individuals are people who are born with either ambiguous genitalia or both sets of genitalia. They do not meet the limited definition of what it means to be male or female, so it's not just binary. They've got too much going on down there. Previously, intersex babies were often given a gender identity as a baby, usually female because it's easier surgically, which caused gender confusion as the child grew up. In the case that Dr. John Money worked on, David R. was a twin boy who accidentally lost his penis during a routine circumcision. And yes, I can tell all of the guys are now cringing when he was eight months old. Dr. Money suggested that the parents change the sex of the boy through surgery, hormone replacement, and raise him as a girl. So David R. became Brenda. Dr. Money used the identical twin as a matched control and believed that this case would support the biosocial theory. In Money's scientific articles, the sex change seemed to be a success, but he failed to publish evidence that went against his theory. Brenda, also known as David, was not happy and felt different from the other girls, and at the age of 15, her parents revealed the truth. Brenda decided to become male again and had reconstructive surgery to create his penis. Now this doesn't negate biosocial theory, but it does negate the idea that gender roles are exclusively the domain of social forces. So there is some inherent understanding of gender that we're born with. Um, 
you know, and, and we as humans have this evolutionary construct that is 150, 100,000 years old that, you know, we're still working our way through. So we're going to work our way now into emotion and it's defined in terms of four components. We respond to a situation, it motivates our behavior, it can be a goal itself such as I want to be happy which is ties it to motivation and it's feeling states that have physiological, cognitive and behavioral components. And there's a whole bunch of emojis that will of course look very obvious to most of you. So qualities of emotion include facial expressions which are recognized across ages and cultures. Voice, posture and gestures also indicate how people are feeling. They are usually uncontrollable and may not respond to reason. So when you have someone who has gotten into a fit of the giggles, no matter how much they try to stop laughing, they can't stop laughing. Um, and same thing with crying. Influence cognitive processes. They affect decisions. They affect our relationships. They affect a lot of the choices we make in our lives. They are hardwired in the brain, so they may be genetic, they came through our evolution, and they have a cultural context in terms of expectation and fulfillment. So if you go to a country like Italy, for example, where emotion is socially acceptable, you're going to see people who are hyper emotional. Whereas you go to um, somewhere else, for example, you go to uh, somewhere like um, Germany, which uh, emotions are not quite as promoted, you're going to see people who are much more neutral in their affect. The functions of emotions um, basically can form these categories. Survival, they protect us. So, you know, we know if we have a certain feeling about something, we need to get out. Attention and memory, they help us evaluate situations. Moral reasoning, sometimes emotions help us do the right thing. If we don't feel right about something, that's telling us something. Social signals, nonverbal communication and and facial expressions. So, you know, when you see somebody who looks really mad, you can tell they're really mad without them having to say a word. And then arousal and motivation. And we get to Yerkes's Dodson Law, which suggests that there is a relationship between performance and arousal. For example, athletes use their nervous arousal to help them win a race. However, too much arousal and they could choke and lose. And, uh, you know, there's dozens of examples of athletes choking um, and then there's dozens of examples of an athlete who's all pent up and ready to go and they win you know just look at who um, Mr. Bolt the fastest man on earth and how often he looked like he was gonna run out of his skin because he was so ready to race so we're going to move on to psychologist Paul Ekman, who initiated research into emotion recognition in the 1960s. His team of scientists provided their test subjects with photos of faces showing different emotional states. The test subjects had to classify the emotional states they saw in each photo from a predetermined list of emotion, possible emotions. Ekman's initial research determined that there were six core emotions, which he termed universal emotions. These included happiness, sadness, fear, disgust, anger, and surprise. And when we use the term universal, what he meant by this was, it didn't matter if you were in the United States, Japan, um, Russia, China, Madagascar, Australia, if you showed pictures of people, these faces, they knew what they meant. But not all emotions are visible. And what about other obvious emotions we feel, such as guilt, shame, jealousy, and pride? While we genuinely feel these emotions, we don't tend to show them clear and obviously. So 
you know, a lot of times we've learned how to hide these emotions because we don't want people to see these emotions because we don't like people knowing that we feel this way. Um, you know, I, I, uh, think that a lot of times we try to hide emotions that we're embarrassed by. Over time, Ekman expanded his model and added additional mo emotions during the 1990s. He added contempt, amusement, contentment, embarrassment, excitement, guilt, pride, and achievement, relief, satisfaction, sensory pleasure, and shame. Some of these can be seen in micro expressions, which can occur in a microsecond, but can be captured on video. Micro expressions are very quick facial expressions involuntarily made by people in particular circumstances, and it is almost impossible to hide micro expressions. There was a television show on a few years ago called Lie to Me, which really just focused exclusively on solving crime through micro expressions. So, Here's some examples of micro expressions. So on the left, what do these six men have in common? They were all caught in a sex scandal. So what do their expressions indicate? Shame, disgust with themselves. I mean, they're pulling their lips in. They're literally sucking in their lips. Their face is turned down. Their eyes are downcast. They're not making eye contact. I mean, it is almost absurd how similar they all look. And then on the right, we have the expression of contempt. And you'll see Lance Armstrong and the guy from Jersey Shore, Simon Cowell, the girl who was, uh, who won silver in the Olympics. She was great. And of course, Joe Biden, who I think in this picture is referring to our current president, number 45, who shall remain nameless. So let's go into the theories of emotion. The James Lang theory of emotion is that physiological changes in the body affect emotions. In other words, our emotions come after the behavioral response to feedback, response to events. It is consistent with the facial feedback hypothesis, which is that the theory suggests that if we change our behavior, we change our feelings. This theory denies the role of cognitive appraisal personal values and personal choice in our behavior and emotional response to events. So the idea here is that the physical nature of our body can change how we feel inside. And this is a very controversial concept because a lot of people say that's not how I feel in my brain. So I can't just put on a happy face and be fine. The Cannon-Bard theory is the theory that physiological and emotional changes occur simultaneously in response to a stimulus, as opposed to the James Lang theory. So, for example, Leonardo DiCaprio is hiking in the forest when he stumbles upon a bear. All at once, he starts sweating, trembling, and feeling extremely afraid. So the stimulus is the bear, the emotion is fear, and the reaction is run away and then the bear jumps on him and we all all of us who saw the revenant knows what happened next then we have the cognitive appraisal theory which thoughts alone cause emotions interpretations or appraisals cause emotions so the physical nature is not as important as what's going on in our brains the Schachter Singer two-factor theory believe that Emotion comes from a combination of a state of arousal and a cognition that makes the best sense of the situation the person is in. For example, the two-factor theory of emotion argues that when people become aroused, they look for cues as to why they feel the way they do. So it's that you get that spidey sense going on in the back of your neck, and you look around and you try and figure out why you're getting that spidey sense three propositions were devised. If a person experiences an emotion for which they have no immediate explanation, they will describe their emotions in terms of the cognitions available to them at the time. 
If a person experiences an emotion for which they have an appropriate explanation, then they will be unlikely to describe their emotions in terms of the alternate cognitions available. If a person is put in a situation which in the past could have made them feel an emotion, they will react re emotionally or experience emotions only if they are in a state of physiological emotion. And then effective neuroscience approach. This theory reasons that emotion is related to a group of structures in the center of the brain called the limbic system and other structures. Areas in the brain being activated or deactivated spark certain emotions. So as we've been talking through the entire term, the amygdala processes fear and it teaches us when to be afraid. The basal ganglia play an important role in motivation, action selection, and reward learning. The insular cortex is associated with empathy. The cerebellum has control of the neural response to rewarding stimuli such as money, substance abuse, and orgasm. And the prefrontal cortex helps control impulsive desires. So this is a very uh, scientific perspective. So I wanted to end on the research on what makes a person happy. So this is all research-based information. This isn't necessarily just what Oprah says. So the first thing is people who live in affluent neighborhoods and earn a good income tend to be very happy. So contrary to the old aphorism that money won't bring you happiness, well, yes, it actually will make you happier. Um, people who are married or in long-term relationships tend to be happy. So, you know, single people, put a ring on it. People who are open to new experiences and meeting new people tend to be happier. Religious individuals tend to be happier. Optimistic individuals who have a cognitive bias that things will ultimately work out for the best tend to be happier. So if you think that, you know, yeah, you know, life can be terrible sometimes, but overall it's pretty good, you'll be happy. Having good self-esteem, feeling good about who you are as a person will make you happier. And finally, personal and or professional achievement. Going back to that idea that self-efficacy will help you handle all the slings and arrows that are thrown at you throughout your life. So that's it for this presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to email or text me. Alternatively, if you are not in this class, please leave a comment and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Have a fabulous day.